Honest, real, raw, true conversation and prayer with God. You go down into the water, and when you do, the old person dies. You come up out of the water as a new creation of Jesus Christ. Hey, welcome to Church Experience. Thank you so much for spending part of your weekend with us. Now is a great time to grab your weeklies and head to your seats if you haven't already because the service starts in 90 seconds. I'm here to tell you today that God wants to set you free. Oh, yeah. He wants to set you free. relationship with him. Grow in your walk with him. Get closer to him. Spend more time with him because he's better. If you want your life to get better, then get around the one who is better. Get around Jesus. Get around the one who has power to change and transform your life. Get around the one who has the perfect grace for you and the perfect love for you and the perfect joy for your soul. Listen, he is better.
Hey, welcome to Church Experience. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today. So excited for today's service. If it happens to be your first time with us, we would love to connect with you. The best way for us to do that is if you head over to churchexperience.tv slash connect. It's also a great place to go if you have any questions, any comments, any prayer requests. We would love to hear from you. We would love to get back to you, and we would love to be praying for you. Well, if you were here last week, you know that we started our brand new teaching series, Storyteller. And I am so excited for week two. So without any further ado, let's get in to it. Let's stand and let's worship our God together.
Psalm 139. You have surrounded me on every side, behind me, before me, and you have placed your hands gently on my shoulder.
Lord, we want to open our hearts. We want to show up and open our hearts for this message. We pray that you come to us and teach us, and we want to be surrounded by you. We want to, to dwell in your presence. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. morning church experience Butler campus we are so glad that you're joining us online here this week and we welcome you as we continue on in our series storyteller this week we want to remind you again that we'd love to meet you right at our campus we've just moved into our brand new building uh, new to us and we are so excited to be right in the heart of the city of Butler we're at 127 East Cunningham Street and uh, we are so excited about the future and the plans that God has and what he's doing. And we invite you to join us there on site Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock a.m. for worship. And we also have some life groups available. There's a ladies one on Tuesday evenings, and there's a men's one that's bi-weekly on Saturdays. And then there's also a Wednesday night one starting this coming Wednesday night on prayer. And that's about a six week one. And then we will regroup and start something fresh with that too. Uh, but we're so excited and, and please check out the website and the times and the availabilities and join us for a life group or even join us uh, for a Sunday morning at 10 a.m. on our new campus. Well, if you have your Bibles, if you go with me to Matthew chapter 18, we're going to pick up with Storyteller. And we're just talking about the different moments that Jesus took time with the crowds of people to share stories. He was uh, known for that. Matthew said that Jesus taught in parables to the crowds of people. He told them stories to illustrate his point. And they were earthly stories with a heavenly meaning. And so today we continue on in Matthew 18 as we unpack this together. You know, there was this, this boy who hated the bathroom situation at his home. He lived in the country, and in the area he had lived in, almost everybody had finally switched over to indoor plumbing except for his family. They still had the outhouse in the backyard right next to the creek, and he hated it. In the winter, it was freezing when he went out to it. In the summer, it was, it was blazing hot, and it smelled horrible. And so he thought to himself, what can we do to get rid of this and, and talk my parents into getting indoor plumbing like everybody else? So he came up with a plan and got a friend to join him, and he grabbed some sticks one day when the creek was swelling over because they had had so much rain, and he thought, if I can tip that into the creek and let it float away, my parents will think it was carried away by the, the water, and hopefully we can get some indoor plumbing. So they tipped it that day with sticks. They used all their strength, and they were able to budge it, and he watched in joy as it floated down the creek away from his home. Well, that night as he got home for dinner and sat at the table, he sat across from his dad who said, son, after dinner, I need to see you in the barn today. He knew that meant something serious and usually that meant he was in trouble. And he said, well, why? For what? And his dad said, well, somebody tipped over the outhouse today. Would you have happened to have anything to do with that? He put his head down and said, well, yes, actually I did. And but then he got a good idea. He remembered learning a story in school about George Washington. And he said, Dad, but you know, I just learned that George Washington chopped down the cherry tree. And when he admitted it and was truthful, he didn't get punished for being truthful. And the dad said, yes, yeah, son. But George Washington's dad wasn't in the cherry tree when he chopped it down. And I love that story. You know, obviously, though, we know that he was about to deal with the wrath of his dad that evening. Can I ask you a question? Are there people in your life today that are dealing with your wrath? 
dealing with your anger, dealing with your frustration towards them. And better yet, a, a, a better question is this. Are they dealing with your unforgiveness towards them? Maybe it's because something they said that hurt. Maybe it's because something they didn't say that you wish they had said. Maybe it's because something they did to you that you wish they hadn't done. Or maybe it's because of something they didn't do that you wish they had done that they never did. But whatever it is, it, it hurt, it stung, it was real, and it stuck in your heart and your mind. And you're battling with unforgiveness now because of that situation with that individual. And here's the thing. These emotions that we're talking about, I know they're hard to push through and to work through. But I want to tell you this morning, it is necessary and critically important for us to move into forgiving those in our lives that need to be forgiven for things that have happened between us and them. It's critically important. C.S. Lewis said this, I love this quote. He said, everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until he has something to forgive. And how true is that? Until there's actually somebody you have to forgive and there's real weight behind that in your life, you don't really feel it, do you? But when you know you have to forgive, that's when it becomes real. And the idea of it isn't so easy anymore. It isn't so simple like you thought it could be and would be when you actually have somebody that you need to forgive. But can I just say, maybe part of the issue is that we don't really understand what forgiveness is and isn't. Let me just challenge you as we launch in here. Forgiveness doesn't mean denying or stuffing your feelings. It doesn't mean that you're going to stuff those feelings back down and pretend they're not there or deny that this is what happened and, and this is what, how it made me feel. That's not what forgiveness is. You can be real about how you feel and about what it meant to you and how it hurt or stung or disappointed you, or frustrated you. It's okay to, to share those kinds of things. It, it doesn't mean that things are going to go back to normal right away. That's not what it means at all when you forgive somebody. And it definitely doesn't mean that you're going to pretend there's no consequences for what has happened. Because things aren't going to be normal necessarily for a while, because there are consequences. There's both positive consequences in life and negative consequences in life for things we do and don't do. And so, yeah, just because you forgive does not mean that there's not going to be consequences for a season of time or maybe even that will carry into life moving forward for quite a long season of time because of what, what took place or what happened. But what forgiveness does mean this morning is, is embracing the offender. It means you're going to go to them. It means you're going you're gonna to seek them out. It means that you're going to make sure that you embrace them and that you push into them and that you work hard to make things right between you and them. It does mean being proactive in making things right. It means you're going to step out to do it as well. You're not going to wait for them because you're the one who knows what's happening inside of you. They may not even know it. And so you're going to go to them. And you're going to be proactive in making it right. Man, Jesus was good at that. He went right to Peter after Peter saw him on the shore that day. And he, after the resurrection of Jesus and Peter denying him three times, and he restored Peter. He forgave Peter for what had happened. How about God in the garden? He pursued Adam and Eve. And how about us? He came to earth in the flesh to pursue us so that we could have his forgiveness in our lives. So it means you're going to be proactive and it means you're going to also surrender the right to get even. And this is a hard one. You're going to surrender that right to get even and to see them hurt, to see them struggle, to see them suffer like maybe you did. You're surrendering that right completely when you forgive somebody. So to help us work through this, Jesus shares this story in Matthew 18 because he wants to show us God's plan on forgiving. So let's read it and then we're going to jump in. Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. And since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. 
Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, and he canceled the debt, and he let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins, and he grabbed him, and he began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded, and his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, I will pay it back. But he refused, and instead he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged, and they went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called in the servant. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all year the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had had on you? And in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So Lord, as we unpack this story of yours, use it to strengthen us and to help us to live how you've called us to in this area of our life in Jesus' name. Amen. So as Jesus shares this, the meaning of this story is to, number one, show us that forgiveness is limitless. Forgiveness is limitless in the believer's life. This is huge. Jesus, in the beginning here, is talking to Peter before he breaks into the story. And Peter said to him in, in this particular verse 21, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister, how many times should I forgive somebody who sins against me? And then he, he throws a number in. Up to seven times, he asks. And I love Peter. Peter's always the one who isn't afraid to rock the boat a little bit. Peter's the one who's not afraid to ask questions. He's not afraid to ask what maybe other people around the circle are even thinking. He just comes right out and he's talking to Jesus and says, So Jesus, when it comes to forgiving people, uh, how many times do I got to do it? Is, is seven good enough, Jesus? I mean, after all, if I have to do it up to seven times, isn't that quite drastic already? I mean, come on. I mean, one time or two times or three times, okay. But seven times, that should be pretty adequate, right? And Jesus, though, answers him and says in verse 22, no, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. What Jesus was saying here to Peter was, Peter, there's not a limit in forgiveness. There's no magical number when it comes to forgiving people in your life and in your world is what he's saying. As often as somebody brings hurt or as often as somebody makes mistakes or as often as somebody offends you, you are called to continue to give out forgiveness to that person no matter what, no matter how many times you need to live in forgiveness. It's limitless, Peter. <laughs> it reminds me of the story I heard of a, of a Bible study that was taking place. And as they were sitting under the teacher's uh, leadership, they were teaching this particular day on the topic of forgiving your enemies. And at the end of the class, the teacher asked, so how many of you will forgive your enemies? And about 50% of the hand shot, that was it. The teacher wasn't happy with that, so they continued for another 15 minutes, pounding the topic, hoping this would make everybody desire to forgive. And still, when they asked this time, only about 95% of the hands went up. So they continued for another five minutes, and this time, everybody's hand, when they asked the question, went up, except for one man, Mr. Jones, in the back. And the teacher looked at Mr. Jones and said, Mr. Jones, don't you have anybody you need to forgive in this life and in this world? How old are you? And he said, I'm 101 years old. And he said, and nope, I don't have anybody to forgive. I've outlived every one of my enemies, he said. <laughs> and I love that story. But in reality, you and I probably are not going to outlive our enemies. Did you know that? We're not going to outlive people we need to forgive. That's just not real reality. And that's why we need to learn to master the art of forgiveness in our lives. That's what we must do. It doesn't matter how many times you've been wronged. It doesn't matter what they did. We must choose to forgive people in this life. This is a, exactly what God has done for us, as a matter of fact. In Psalm 103, it says these words in verses 8 on. It says, the Lord is compassionate and gracious. He's slow to anger 
and he's abounding in love. Aren't you glad for that? I love those words. It says he's compassionate and gracious and slow to anger. And yeah, he, he abounds in love towards us. I'm so thankful for that truth. And then it says this, he will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. And sometimes we're guilty of that, aren't we? We continue to point the finger. We continue to accuse people of the wrong they've done towards us. And, and we, we keep that anger inside of our hearts, inside of our minds, and we don't let go. But thankfully, God in his economy doesn't do that. And because of that, he expects us not to do that the same thing either. And then it says this, I love this in verse 10. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. And that's the grace of God. And that's what he's asking us to do, not to repay people the way that we think they should be repaid for what they've done or to treat them the way that we think they should be treated for the wrong they've done. No, but to stand up and stand out and to be a people of grace and forgiveness towards them. Jesus did this on the cross in Luke chapter 23 and verse 34. He's there between two criminals and they're getting ready to, to take his clothes and divide them up by casting lots. And listen to what it says. Jesus said to the father in that moment, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? They're taking the very life of Jesus. They're, they're mocking him and ridiculing him. What's he do? He begs the Father to forgive those individuals because they don't understand what they're doing. Stephen did the same thing as he was being stoned. The first Christian martyr in the early church, Stephen, he's there being stoned to death, literally. And guess who's there? Saul, who we know as the Apostle Paul later approving of it. And it says in verse 60 that when he fell on his knees, he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. <laughs> forgiveness. Even as he's being stoned to death, he's saying, God, please don't hold this against them. I forgive them. Please forgive them too. Or how about Joseph in the Old Testament? This is an, a really powerful one because I think it hits close to home for many of us who have been wrong. Joseph, we know, was sold into slavery by his brothers because they hated him. He was dad's favorite, wasn't he? Jacob's favorite. And so they sold him to a traveling caravan and he ends up in Egypt and he ends up in Potiphar's house, a high ruling official. And after he's falsely accused uh, by Potiphar's wife who made advances towards him, he's put in the king's prison. And after he's in the king's prison, he interprets some dreams for the, for the cupbearer and the baker. And uh, basically they forget about him till the king has some dreams that nobody can interpret. And Joseph then is catapulted as the second in command of the entire nation to lead them through the severe drought that was happening. And it's only then that his brothers have it revealed to them who Joseph is. And as he brings the family his direction, they're living at peace with him. And then dad dies. <clears throat> and after Jacob dies, the brothers began to get fearful. And they think, well, what if he now gets back at us for what we did? We were terrible to him. What if he didn't really forgive us? And, and it says these words in verse 15 of Genesis 50. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? See, that's the human heart, isn't it? We, we hold grudges. We, we're going to get them back. We're going to pay them back. And that's what they were thinking was going to happen. That's a people-style forgiveness, not a God-style forgiveness, and not a forgiveness that God's children are even meant to have, as we see. So they sent word to Joseph, verse 16, saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of God, of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. It broke his heart. That his brothers would even think this about him. And he thought, man, they know who I am. They know I'm a man of integrity and character. They've been around me for this season of time, even since I brought the families to us. And listen to his response. But Joseph said to them in verse 19, don't be afraid. I'm in the place of God. <laughs> you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done the saving of many lives. So then he says, don't be afraid. 
I will provide for you and your children. And listen to what it says about Joseph. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. In other words, he helped remove any doubts that they had. And he was going to be moving into forgiving them no matter what. Which leads back to what Peter was told by Jesus. No, Peter. In verse 22, not seven times. I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Peter, there's no number. Forgiveness is limitless in the kingdom of God. Dr. Gary Chapman said these words. He said, forgiveness is not a feeling. It's a commitment. Think about that for a second. It is. It's a commitment that you're making. I'm not going to let my feelings lead me and guide me, but I'm going to be committed to forgiving because this is what God has done. He committed to forgiving us by sending his only son and Jesus coming and taking that journey to the cross and then to the tomb and out of the tomb. They made a commitment, and so should we. It's a choice to show mercy, and that's what it is. Not to hold the offense up against the offender. And not only is it a, a choice and a commitment, but it says forgiveness is an expression of love. And let me tell you, it's an expression of the love of God flowing through us as his children when we forgive like our Father forgives. And God, listen, this is powerful. He never has turned out anyone who has asked for forgiveness, and he's never set limits on how often he'd forgive them. And we need to do the same. That's the first thing this parable means. The second thing it means is that I'm expected to forgive just like my father does. Have you ever heard that statement? You're To somebody, you look just like your father. You look just like your mother. You act just like your parents. Well, we are called to act just like our father and especially when it comes to forgiveness, right? Listen to Matthew 18, 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Now, when this is translated, it literally means this man owed him millions of dollars. So this was no small debt. This was a big deal. And since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. And listen to verse 27. This is the heart of God. The servant's master took pity on him, and he canceled the debt, and he let him go. I, I love that. He released him. He had pity. He was he was freeing him. He forgave his debt. He canceled it. He erased it. He let him off the hook. He, he showed compassion. What an amazing forgiveness this is that we see modeled here. And this is exactly what we are to model in our lives after our Heavenly Father. Paul even says this in Ephesians 4.32. He says, be kind and compassionate to one another. But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just say, hey, live out kindness and compassion to each other. But he says also this tall order, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Did you see that? He's saying, and you know what you are to do? You're to be forgivers like your father. Just as he forgave us, just as he forgave you, you are to be dishing out forgiveness to others like he does. It reminds me of uh, the story of Dave Hagler. Dave Hagler was driving one day in Colorado and he got pulled over by a cop. And the cop gave him a hefty ticket for the speed he was going. And he knew it was going to be a huge fine. And he knew it was going to probably make a sure insurance skyrocket. So he begged the cop for mercy. But the cop wouldn't budge. He said, listen, if you want mercy, go to court and fight it. And not my problem. And he gave him the ticket and he left. Well, sure enough, it was a huge fine. And it also raised his insurance quite a bit. And he wasn't super happy about that. A number of weeks later, if you fast forward, Dave was an umpire for a, for a rec league of baseball teams of adult players. And there he was on the mound, umpiring a game at home plate. When all of a sudden, guess who came walking up to bat? You got it right. It was the cop. He looked at Dave and recognized him, and Dave recognized the cop right away. And the cop looked at him and said, so how did that whole thing turn off the ticket? To which Dave shook his head and said, you better swing at everything that comes your way, buddy. <laughs> but isn't that the human heart in all seriousness? We, we hold a grudge. We, we not only hold a grudge, but we get bitter, and we think, man, I'm going to get even. 
I'm going to get back at that person. But we can't afford to do this. Matter of fact, right after this man and this story Jesus shares leaves this moment of amazing grace, this moment filled with amazing grace from God, from his master. Look, look what happens. Verse 28, when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. Now, let's just stop there. This fellow servant only owed him a hundred silver coins. He owed all the gold coins earlier, millions of dollars of gold coins. This guy just owed him literally a little teeny bit of, of money, thousands of dollars. That's it compared to millions that he just had been forgiven. And it says he grabbed him and he began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I'll pay it back. Sound familiar? Just like he did with his master. Oh, but the story doesn't end there, unfortunately for him. He refused. Verse 30 says he refused. And instead he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and they went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in and said this, Oh, you wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had had on you? And in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back everything he owned. But listen to this scary ending. Listen to this verse to kind of capture the story. Jesus not only is saying, man, this guy did the opposite of what was given to him, but he then says this in the end. This, verse 35, is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or your sister. Look what it says from your heart, from deep within, right? In other words, in heaven's economy, he's going to get back what he dished out, is what Jesus is saying. See, there's two sides to forgiving, is what Jesus is saying. When you choose to forgive, your heavenly Father takes notice, and he forgives you. But when you don't choose to forgive, your heavenly Father takes notice too. And the way that you dish it out is the way that you're going to receive it back from him. Jesus reiterated this in Matthew Chapter 6, verses 12, 14, and 15. This is amazing. When he's teaching them how to pray, he says in verse 12 of Matthew 6, and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. What, what a scary prayer if you're living with unforgiveness. When you pray that, you're saying to the Heavenly Father, oh, forgive me, please, like I'm forgiving Joe over there or Beth or Ben. You know, wow, you better be careful how you pray, right? Can you pray that in all honesty this morning? Father, forgive me as I forgive others of their debts. Can you pray that without it being dangerous? If not, you got to do a heart check today. Or how about what Jesus says in the next verses, 14 and 15? For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That's what we're talking about. In heaven's economy, you'll be forgiven if you forgive. But verse 15, if you do not forgive others for their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. See, these words of Jesus must have shocked the disciples. These, these, were, these were words that were a call to a radical living. These were words that were a call to countercultural living. He's saying, don't be like everybody else and hold grudges and get bitter and get even with everybody. No, you are called to be different. You are called to be like your Father and to forgive just as he does and to remember that forgiveness is limitless I, I love this quote lewis b smead says this to forgive is to set a prisoner free and then to discover that the prisoner was you so true when you forgive you do set the prisoner free you're not only freeing the person that you're holding that grudge and bitterness against but you're freeing yourself to also live free in forgiveness from the Heavenly Father as well. So here's the closing question. <laughs> here's a question. 
that I want to ask you. Is there anybody in your life that you need to forgive? Maybe a friend, maybe a coworker, maybe an acquaintance, maybe a family member, but you've been bitter, you've been holding a garage, you've been holding out on making things right with them. Can I tell you, if that's you this morning, then it is drastically affecting your life right here and right now. And it's affecting not only your relationship with them, but your relationship with the Heavenly Father. And just as we are called to ask for forgiveness to the Father, we need to be givers of forgiveness to others around us that have wronged us too. And I don't know about you, but Jesus knew as he shared this story that without forgiving others, that you would affect and mess up your relationship, not only with those people, but with the Heavenly Father. And when we forgive, hold on, <laughs> because when you forgive, you open up that fire hydrant, don't you? That fire hose of amazing grace, you just douse that person with amazing grace. But when you forgive them with that hose, God opens the fire hydrant of heaven and douses you with amazing grace and his forgiveness right back at you. And what a gift it is. So friend, as we close, Jesus shared this story to show us that forgiveness is limitless and that we are called to be like our Father and forgive as He does. Who do you have to forgive this week and work on your heart towards? I could encourage you to check that out as you pray and spend time with God. You probably already know. And if you already know and it's on your heart who that person is, go to them, make it right, deal with it so that you are right with both them your Father in heaven. So Heavenly Father, thank you for the amazing grace you've dished out on us. Thank you for the amazing forgiveness we've received through you. I pray that we will be givers of that same amazing grace to those in our lives as well. Thank you, Jesus, for this story and for teaching us on this amazing topic today of how we are to be like the Father and forgive you. Now help us to live it out and to make things right with those that we need to as we move forward this week, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you again for joining us online. And again, come join us on our campus, 127 East Cunningham Street, 10 a.m. Sunday mornings. God bless you. We're praying for you and hope to see you soon. Have a great week. Before our usher team comes by to collect our response cards and receive our tithes and offerings, here's a few important things happening with our CE family. First class is coming soon. If you're hungry for God to do more in your life and want to learn how to get more connected with CE, this is your next step. First class is a catalyst to launch you into the life of your church experience family and to learn more about our history, beliefs, mission, vision, and how you can benefit from getting more involved. As the ushers come forward to collect our response cards and receive our tithes and offerings, Imagine being able to impact the lives of people that you never get a chance to meet. As you give at CE, that's exactly what you're doing. Touching lives beyond your friend groups and your community. Your generosity helps to invest in kids and students who want to grow up as leaders for Jesus. It also helps to start churches all across the United States. And it helps many people in need right here locally. If you're wondering how to jump on this mission with your CE family, you can choose to give in person, online, through our app, or you can even sign up for recurring giving. Join us with expectations of seeing more people experience a full life in Jesus Christ. Thank you for your commitment, prayers, investment of time, and financial generosity that truly helps more people experience a full life in Jesus Christ.
Well, as week two of our Storyteller Teaching Series is coming to a close, we would love to hear what you thought about today's service. Head over to churchexperience.tv slash connect. It's also a great place to go if you have any questions, any comments, or any prayer requests. We'd love to hear from you, love to get back to you, and we would love to be praying for you. If you want some more Church Experience content throughout your week, head over to our social media pages, our Facebook, our Instagram. Also, head over to the Church Experience website and download the Church Experience app. We hope to see all of you back here next week, but until then, we'll see you.